It looked like Bette Miller, Midler came in. If Bette there Midler you. is here, that's great. Hey, that's better for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, it's Barry Milder. Milner. Milner, yeah. I thought it was Bette Midler, and I thought, my goodness. Is she still with us? <laughs> I hope so. Well, John is setting the tone for, for the session. We will wait just for a couple of minutes just to uh, make sure everyone is in here. Are there more people in snowstorming uh, situations? I live in the Netherlands and we have snow since a long, long time. Yep, so do I. Yeah, I am enjoying it. Yes. So do I, I'm in Berlin. Ah. Wonderful, right? Ah, just rubbing into summer. John, thank you very much for, for setting the tone. You can still, you can continue because people hear me, but I will I will share my screen to the presentation. Let's see if People are still coming in, Inga, so maybe just uh, one more minute. One more minute? Okay. Yeah. Let's go for one more minute. It's almost me me meditative to, to listen to John's guitar play. Well, I am in a monastery, sort of. Barry, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I noticed. All right, what do you think? Can we start a meeting or? I think we can. Yeah. 45 people in the room. 45 people. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. And welcome to our fireside chat session with John D. Liu, the 
founder of Ecosystem Restoration Camps, and Chris Case, the founder and CEO of Camp Main Springs in Tanzania. Very lovely to have you here. Um, just some house rules in terms of what we are doing differently than last time is that we would like to engage you more uh, within this session. So we would like to um, please hold your questions until after Chris's presentation because we would like you to raise your hand if you have a question so you are able to ask it in person. We'll make sure that we have a little bit more engagement with, with you guys. And we also, um, this session will last for one hour, but we'll faci facilitate one uh, hour just to um, have time for an open discussion if you feel um, free to stay. So you can decide on yourself and we will decide what kind of topic we would, topic we would like to discuss after one hour. So um, thanks again. First, I would like to highlight some camp news. Um, this month, I would like to highlight Camp Contour Lines. Um, they got a visit from a conservation biologist and together they are um, working on data collection for their food forest sites. So that's a great achievement. And they are also experimenting with value added products from the food forest. For example, um, they're trying out artisanal cacao, tropical salsas and kombuchas to sell and to sustain their projects. So I think that's fun to share as well. And they are expanding from 12 to 16 vill villages. So they are improving livelihoods of many uh, of the local uh, communities. So um, great news for them. And um, they even won the Permaculture Magazine Prize um, because they had the best project in terms of uh, transforming lives and landscapes. So um, that's some happy news to share in this uh, 2021. Um, we also are announcing some new camp experiences. Um, obviously, COVID is still an issue, um, but we spoke with the camps and they do want to plan it ahead. So we, we're not sure if it will happen, but we decided to announce it. Um, it's not officially announced yet. It will be after one week or two on our website, but we just wanted to give you a heads up that we are trying to make this work. Um, for example, Camp Mama Adama in Portugal is um, hosting their first camp ever from the 3rd of April until the 10th, and they will allow until 10 to 15 members. Um, and Camp Amrakum in the UK is planning a series of rewilding, a short learning experiences, and the first one will be in April as well. And then Camp Versailles in France, um, the one who was in the fireside chat session in January, uh, they are hosting their first camp ever as well from the 23rd until the 30th. So we don't know for sure if it will happen, but we are obviously, we are very hopeful that we can organize these uh, camps. All right, and then what we are here for, um, I'm very grateful that Camp Main Springs uh, become an ecosystem restoration camp, I think since 2020, 2021. So they are very new to us and we are very proud that they have become part of our movement. And um, yeah, I would like to share a little uh, introduction video of their project. Um, let me see if this will work. And otherwise, I will go back to that. Okay, so I got it here as well. A seed can change the world. A seed becomes a farm. A farm feeds a country. And I couldn't need seeing that again. We can't see it. And the new generation leads the way. Helemaal niet. No, you need to share the screen with the video too. You're only sharing the PowerPoint. Okay, let me see if I can share share your screen again. I will stop share and I will play. Share it again. Share. Sorry for that, everyone. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Let's enjoy. 
a seed can change the world. A seed becomes a farm. A farm feeds a country. A country raises a new generation. And the new generation leads the way into a brighter tomorrow. For nearly 15 years, Maine Springs has helped Tanzanians plant these seeds. Literally. Mr. Max has already planted over 500 seeds today, and it's not even lunchtime. Beans, papaya, corn, peppers, limes, kale, pomegranate, eggplant, and a bunch of other crops we don't even have time to name. Our permaculture farms have become so successful that we founded the Permaculture Institute of Tanzania, teaching farmers across the region how sustainability leads to prosperity. Sustainability is the same reason we built a school. Here, students discover, explore, and pursue their own passions. That's how we ended up with this robotics club and this amazing school dance team. Incredible things happen when you give everyone the chance to live their dreams. You don't just help one person. You touch the lives of everyone that person helps. Like Elizabeth and Peyton. Elizabeth wants to be the Minister of Education in Tanzania. And Peyton is going to be a reporter highlighting the injustices in our country. They were two of the first residents in our girls' home. And now they're inspiring the next generation of girls to become strong, independent leaders. Like these girls. And this girl. And definitely those girls. But it's hard to transform your own community when you're sick. Meet Dr. Kajiru. She thinks laughter is the best medicine. But not from Laria. Actually, for that, she prescribed a three-day treatment of anti-malarials. Permaculture, education, healthcare, and empowering girls. That's what we believe creates a sustainable future. We do it because we believe in the potential of every person. Like we believe in the potential of every seed to grow into something remarkable. A seed really can change the world. But first, we have to plant it together. Wow. All right. I would like to give the word to John. Yeah, thank you. That was really lovely. We're, I'm, I'm very curious about your story. But I'm, it was already continuing the show. Okay, I would like to give the word to John. Oh. Because John has been to Main Springs as well. So John, would you like to share a couple of words? Yes, a couple of words. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm not by the fire today. It's um, eight in the morning. But um, I did make a fire yesterday. Uh, outside. So maybe Inga, you could start the video and I can discuss that over it. We'll see um, if this works. Give it a shot. Maybe. In, What's happening? Are you s seeing anything? Um, difficult, quite white spaces. I see a folder called videos with nothing in it. Do you, do you see anything? I'll share. Do you see anything Let's now? See. Black. Oh yes, maybe, maybe it's coming, but it's, it's taking a little time. Here we go. But, it, oh, it's, it's a tinkly guitar. Oh yes. Oh, there's me. Right. Well, it's moving rather slow, but uh, I'm not sure that's going to work for us. Let me see. Can, can I share my screen instead? Yes. I don't know if it will. Yeah, let me, try, let me try sharing because that either that's not working for me or Kumar. Hello, Kumar. So I'm going to try it once more and then we'll see if it works. And then if it does, okay. So I'm at the, um, it's called the, uh, it's 
called the University, it was called the University of the Trees. This was the home of Christopher Hills, who created spirulina as a superfood. He thought it would be possible to share this all over the world. And um, it has become quite the, quite the thing. And um, so I, I'm standing near a, a, a statue of St. Francis and truly all the animals come here and they don't seem to be afraid of me at all. So the other day, one of my colleagues here, the bird actually landed on, on her, just landed on her shoulder. So we can expect this kind of thing now. And this place is a, is a beautiful place that is restoring both the forest around it and growing uh, a food forest and permaculture planting. And it's, it's partly to, it's partly to do restoration work and it's partly to help people to heal. So this is, that garden is called the Garden of Forgiveness. So I guess for my sins, I'm in the Garden of Forgiveness instead of at home, partly because the COVID has kept me locked out. But I just, I just wanted to say that being in nature is something that is really very helpful for me personally. And going to, to the main, Camp Main Springs in Tanzania was also quite an experience because it's such a beautiful place right on the edge of Lake Victoria. And I had been in the region before, but it was kind of a hectic time where I was studying and taking a Jeep journey through the country, so it was a lot of work. And um, so this time I got to see the, the camp and, and Mark Shepard was training there. And there were campers or people who had come for the training countries. And I believe that this is a methodology for massively growing East Africa into a camps movement just in East Africa. So there are many countries there all needing the same thing. So if we can build little oases in the training places, then I'm pretty sure it will spread throughout the region. And in my experience, um, working with the United Nations, and other organizations is that this is exactly what needs to happen in Africa because these, the conditions change when the land changes and when the understanding changes. And if the understanding and the, the landscapes don't change, then poverty is more or less inevitable. So the the fact is, <clears throat> we can't go there and, and, and change the situation, but we can help to train the local people to do it. And this is, here's St. Here's Francis. He's got a bird on his arm. Anyway, um, I think it's, it's really going to be a wonderful way to develop the camps movement and for a lot of people to be able to go and share the experience and understand what's happening in other parts of the world. So East Africa is one and I, I have to tell you that Central America and South America and Asia and parts of the Mediterranean and the Middle East all have this have these issues and when I began to think about this after after quite a long time of studying and participating in, in big restoration programs, I realized that the only way we're gonna succeed is if we do this together and as, as humanity, humanity needs to do this, not agencies. The only agency that can succeed 
is human civilization. So um, this place is very beautiful and I'm, I'm, I'm working on this. This is run by an organization called Grow the Change and it would be very wonderful for Grow the Change to join the movement and I think they, they, they will. Um, we've been discussing how, how to go about that. And uh, I also wanted to go back to the fire side chat theme. So hope tonight what I did was I built a fire. And so you can hear the frogs singing in the background. This was very, very interesting last night because we have a lot of frogs and there's also some other really endangered species in this region and it was very contemplative that's why i play this tinkly music it's sort of meditative it's it's trance music or something like that um and i i started thinking about energy flows because when you burn this fire when you burn the wood then the energy is released and it's 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 also connected to really long historical time because people sat around the fire and i was i was thinking about we've lost something that i think is very past. we used to dance around the fire and then uh when we wanted it to rain <laughs> or we danced around the fire to celebrate fertility at certain times of the year. This is the moment for that, I think. But um, I'm going to stop here because it's over. And I'm going to stop my share. And thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't babble too much. And it's great to see you all and to have this opportunity. Thank you, John. Thank you for your words. And um, I would like to give the word to, to Chris. I um, will share my screen again, but this time I can't make any mistakes. So hopefully you all see the presentation from Chris. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are in the world. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very excited to share the story um, of Main Springs. Um, so we started as an organization about, uh, well, six, 15 years ago now. Um, so we're, We've had a little bit of, of history and all of that, but I wanted to first, and if we can go to the next slide, um, talk about how I got to Tanzania. So I was born and raised in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, here in the USA. And my path to Tanzania actually started when I stood up on my kindergarten career day and said, I wanna be an exotic animal veterinarian in the Serengeti National Wildlife Park of Tanzania, East Africa. I had wild ambitions of living and working with wildlife in the Serengeti and always dreamed of going there. And my grandmother, who was, Inga, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. And my grandmother, who was at my kindergarten career day, um, said, I promise when you turn 16, um, I will take you on this safari. And so every year we'd talk about the different parks we wanted to visit and research both Tanzania and Kenya. And this dream just continued to build throughout my entire childhood. And as we were actually planning to go on this safari, my grandmother threw a little wrench in the chain and said, in order for you to get the safari, um, I want you to volunteer and work in Tanzania with, at the Center for Street Boys. And you know, if you do that for two weeks, then we can get a two week safari. And I said, absolutely not. I'm not interested in working with people. Let's just stick to the animals. And she said, tough cookies, you get both or none. And so I dragged my feet as a 16 year old on this volunteer trip. And we'll go to the next slide. So I went with my grandmother when I was 16 and we volunteered at a center for street boys uh, for two weeks. And I can say hands down, it was the one trip that changed my entire life, my worldview, my perspective of privilege. And I immediately fell in love with uh, the culture and the people and everything about Tanzania and devoted to going back throughout the rest of my high school summers to uh, volunteer at the center for street boys. Um, it was a very new organization when I first started there. They only had a couple of buildings. Um, one building had 98 boys and only one dorm pair and it was completely packed. And I noticed after talking to these boys and the staff and the director that 
you know, they were really struggling to get by. Um, they oftentimes only had enough to provide very basic meals just twice a day. They had no protein, they had no vegetables. And so I decided that, you know, during my school year, I would try to fundraise for various projects. And the first one we did was a chicken project. And we wanted free range chickens. And so that's me on the, the right, uh, building a, a chicken coop where they can go up at night. Um, but we wanted to just be able to, you know, instill a little bit more sustainability within this organization. And it was a great learning experience. I started to learn Swahili, the national language of Tanzania. I got to know more about the challenges of Tanzania, got to more, know more about the culture uh, throughout those years. Um, but one question kept coming up over and over, and that was, where are the girls? So if we can go to the next, next slide. Um, at the time when we started Main Springs, um, there were about five to eight organizations working with street boys and orphan boys in the area, but not much was being done for the girls. And many times these girls were in horrific situations. We've had girls come directly from brothels, some that were forced into domestic servitude situations, some that were um, living on the street or just homeless. And so we wanted to provide a safe and loving home um, for these, these young women. And I was only 19 years old at the time going into college. I was young and dumb, I like to say, and just had this ideal fantasy of we're just going to build these, these houses and be able to house these girls. Um, and we did. And so we started very, very small in the beginning. It was hard for us to eventually, um, you know, even fundraise in the beginning and kind of get, get everything going. We started with one very basic house, um, seven girls our first year. And as we lived and worked in this rural community, because we wanted to be out of the city, um, we realized that just providing a safe, loving home for these girls was not enough. There's gonna be a much larger need for the community and we can't just educate and empower these women. We have to work collaboratively with the entire community to address all of their needs. So, you know, in the area that there's very poor education, um, Farmers have huge tracts of land, but were unable to even provide enough food for their own families throughout the year. Um, there was minimal infrastructure and in economy. There was no market in the area, and there were major health issues. A lot of people were dying or becoming very, very sick from very um, treatable diseases because they didn't have access to a doctor. And that's really how our entire organization came to be. It was out of the necessity that was expressed to us by the community and by observing the community. So you can get the next one. So like I said, we started very, very small. This is actually our first house where we ha housed our first girls, uh, built with all local granite rock um, and just did what we could year by year. So the first couple of years, we were just very, very true to that. Um, we can go to the next one, that idea of um, empowering and just providing a safe, loving home for these girls. Um, here's a few of our, our girls today. Um, we have close to 30 graduates that are in college or beyond. We have uh, 48 girls on our first campus and 16 on our second campus, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but they you know, basically have nowhere else to go and we um, house them in self-contained apartment style, family style dormitories, um, where no more than eight girls live with the matrons so that they can follow up with their schoolwork, their chores, really make sure that they're developing these young women to become strong, independent leaders for their society. Um, but one of the other things we noticed, which was the second thing that we did as an organization, and we can go to the next slide, Inga, um, was that education in the community um, was very, very poor. The two pictures on the left of this screen here um, are actually of the local primary school in the area. Um, at the time when we just started as a girls' home, we were sending our girls to this uh, public school, and um, there were over 900 students and only three teachers. So they had almost a 300 to one across eight different grade levels, 300 to one um, student teacher ratio. And obviously parents, the community um, really, really wanted to be able to provide a more quality education. And so collaboratively with the community, we built another school and we now have 450 boys and girls from preschool all the way through secondary school. Um, we have a 16 to one student teacher ratio. Um, so a little bit better than the 300 to one and Unlike a lot of the schools in Tanzania um, that really just focus on the academics, we really want to focus on the holistic students. So we um, teach them a variety of things. You saw in the introduction video, we have robotics and we have technology things. We also encourage um, local arts and local dance and, and drumming. 
we teach permaculture, we have community service programs, we really want to create holistic world citizens from our school who also excel academically, and they do. Um, since starting our school back in 2010, we've had a 100% pass rate on all of our national exams, um, which nationally in Tanzania, um, less than half of students typically pass the national exam, so our students are very well um, set up, and our school is actually ranked number 60 in the entire nation of Tanzania. Um, out of several thousand schools. So our education is top notch. And like I said, our students are able to get a lot of hands-on learning. Um, and like I said, when we kind of were observing the challenges of the community, um, we noticed a lot of families just didn't have access to healthcare. They'd have to travel 20 to 30 miles um, to just go see a doctor or nurse. Um, oftentimes that was cost prohibitive for the types of families that needed to access that, those services. And so we wanted to do something about that. And we now have a full-time doctor and nurse in a small clinic who mostly focus on preventative um, health education, but also are able to provide a variety of testing and treatment for a wide array of tropical diseases, different infections, and um, yeah, just various healthcare services so that we can make sure that our students, our staff, and the entire surrounding community can stay healthy. Because if you're not healthy, you can't go to the farm and work, you can't go to school. Um, it's obviously, as we all know, um, a key um, to living a healthy and happy life. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so with all of these things going on, we had quite a bit of land around us. We were trying to do some gardening. We were trying to do some, some livestock. It was kind of hit and miss for a long time. And thanks to one of our now board members and um, their foundation, so it's the RJOF Reed J. Oppenheimer Foundation and the Oppenheimer family, they introduced us to Mark Shepard back in 2012. And he came and um, observed our campus, looked at everything, and he said, we can totally retrofit this campus and make it a food forest, make it more productive. He was very excited. It was grandiose ideas. We're like, this sounds great, but how do we do it? And so he started training us and our staff and some of the local community members on some of the basics of permaculture. And we can go to the next slide and see, um, this is actually a picture of Mark just this past year in front of our very first demonstration plot. Um, on the left, you'll see this is what our land looked like before. As you can see, it's very, very sandy soil, um, not a lot of um, biodiversity happening. Um, on the right, you can see our very first tree rows that we um, installed and planted. And that's the beginning. So that's, that's kind of where we started. And we had a very, very rocky start. Um, first of all, there was a lot of hesitation, even from our own staff and the surrounding community members about, you know, this method won't work. This, is how, this isn't how we do it. This is, you know, we need this type of corn. We need these beans. You have to put this fertilizer in the soil. You have to do this watering. And so it took, um, you know, a good couple of years to really get by in. Even, even stuff like maintaining mulch and keeping mulch on, on trees was a, a struggle for the first couple of years. And our biggest struggle also came when um, our staff decided not to keep the goats uh, contained very well. So we actually had planted several hundred trees in these tree rows. And the very first year, um, about six to eight months after we planted them all, the goats destroyed absolutely everything in our fields. We had several acres of trees just completely decimated by both our own goats, which we ended up getting rid of and getting sheep instead, um, as well as the neighbor's goats. So we had a very rocky start, but after a couple years and just kind of staying with it, um, our staff and, and community really started to see the change. Um, on the left, you'll see actually a picture of our, our neighbor's property. Um, as you can see, it's completely sandy soil. It's um, just maize that they're trying to grow and they really don't get a lot out of their, their farms. Even if a single family can have 10 or 20 acres, um, they really oftentimes, like I said, don't get enough to even feed their families, let alone sell for a profit. And on the right is a recent picture of Mark Shepard in our food forest. And you can see there's um, a variety of squash, bananas, plantains, neem, um, I'm trying to see what else is in there, but a variety of citrus and other fruit trees. Um, and it's really a prolific, um, no, only eight years later, but it's still just a prolific and productive um, yeah, system that is, that is really, really working. So we can go to the next slide. So like I said, the first years were very, very rocky, but one of the things that we've learned time and time again, whether it's with education and trying to change kind of the theory of, you know, how do we educate a student? How do we make a student a well-rounded student? 
um, whether it's you know the different types of healthcare services we provide that may seem different. Um, we've learned that leading by example has always been a very successful way to get community involvement, and that's exactly what happened with permaculture. Once our neighbors and different organizations started to see how different our farm and our soil is compared to the neighbors and the other areas they've seen, they start asking questions of, you know, how is this possible? Why do you do it this way? What's what's happening here? And we started engaging a lot of different community members in that conversation, got more staff, started expanding our farm. We had a lot more buy-in. We got, you know, more people trained in, in our permaculture design courses and really just started to see things click more and more. You can see on the next slide, there's a lot of community members coming and learning about berms and swales and key lines and different design features of ways they can implement these techniques on their farms. One of the things we also wanted to do as an organization is make sure that we were um, using very local techniques, local tools, um, low cost inputs so that we could be a living example for, you know, we're not some international organization that just comes in and spends a ton of money to make this happen. You know, we're doing this in a very local way and you can see it for yourself actually happening. Um, so this is one of our permaculture design courses last year. And you can see just the next couple slides, a couple of our um, more mature food forest. Again, we're only eight years in, but before all of this, it was just completely sandy, little bit of grass, maybe some shrubs, but not much happening. As you can see now, we have plentiful fruit. We have a variety of livestock from pigs to milk cows to um, rabbits, chickens. And this is also a great satellite image that we found. So if you can see our main property outline of the main garden that we started um, back in 2012, Still, as I said, by 2014, not a lot was happening. We were still trying to get that buy-in. We were still trying to get people to understand the different techniques and methodologies. But you can see from the same day in 2014, which is in sometime in January, to the same day in 2020, there's just a massive transformation. You can see, you know, much, much more tree coverage, a lot more green. Um, and I think that, that really kind of helps to, to show how much has happened in a relatively short amount of time. And one of the more impressive things, too, is um, this is a recent photo that we've taken. Um, this is the soil from our neighbor's farm, literally right next door to us, um, compared to the soil on our farm. There's, it was probably taken about 10 to 20 meters apart from each other, so you can see just the massive difference, even within 10 to 20 meters, of that transformation in the soil. And that's really, you know, what we love to see. So there's a few things that we're doing as an organization. Um, the first is we really wanted to, you know, not just stay in that one community of this village called Kitongo. We wanted to take what we've learned, take what we've done and try to transplant that and be a replicable model in another community. So back in 2017, we decided to purchase another piece of land, which is about uh, 40, 45 acres. And again, it's right on the shore of Lake Victoria, but it's about three hours away from our first campus in an entirely new community. And much like the first campus, as you can see, it was just a barren piece of land where even the previous owner, as you can see on the right, had cut down most of the trees on the property for wood or for whatever. And, you know, not much was being done with it except for um, very poor harvest of uh, cassava. Um, so in 2017, we started uh, transforming that land, designing it. We can go to the next slide. And you can see the difference. So these two photos are actually 2018 on the left and 2019. So there's only about a 16 month difference between the two pictures right there. And you can just see the, the transformation that's happened. And on this second campus, we are going to do the exact same thing that we've done on the first one of replicating everything from the girls home. So we've already started the girls home on a very small scale with 16 girls. Um, we've also started a primary school. So we have up to second grade now and we'll continue to add um, different grade levels as they, the students progress. We're also going to be providing health care and we're also going to be doing the same type of permaculture education and trying to spread this around this community as well. Um, so we're very excited about the, the you know, possibility of growth and, and what can happen there. And as you saw in the video, we've also in the past couple of years started the Permaculture Institute of Tanzania because we've seen all of this success. We've seen all of this stuff that's happening within our own organization, but we, you know, decided that's not good enough. We need to do a lot more. This needs to be spread not only to, you know, to our campuses in this one community. 
we need to spread, as John said, all throughout East Africa and all throughout the world. And so we've created partnerships with the Oppenheimer Foundation, Mark Shepard, um, and several other organizations who really struggled to, you know, have the ability, both knowledge as well as financial ability to start their own permaculture farms. And so we started very, very slow about three years ago, um, had eight people in our first official international PDC course. And last year we opened it up and provided grants to local organizations from Malawi, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda. And had about 30, 35 people or so um, attend that course, received training from Mark Shepard, one of our own permaculture trainers who's on staff. And they are now working throughout all of East Africa to really kind of have this type of transformation in their own communities. And combined, there's 10 organizations plus Mainsprings. And what's truly amazing is through this, this partnership and this grant opportunity and different funders, um, the collective impact of our organization is over 11,000 people. So we were making, you know, a massive impact by not doing too much more other than basic support and training and all of that. And that's, you know, exactly what the ERC community is about. And that's why we're so excited to be um, involved in this community and involved in this movement. And, you know, it just fit perfectly in with what we're doing. And um, yeah, we're excited to kind of continue. So I think we're, yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think we're kind of running a little bit. I know we wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, so that's my kind of brief intro and how I got to Tanzania, what we're doing now and where we want to go in the future. But I will kick it back to Inga and happy to answer any questions anyone has. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Such an amazing achievement. Um, I see we only have 15 minutes for the first hour. So please, if anyone has a question, uh, raise your hands. Um, and I will give you, yes, Melissa, first, I will, oh, yes. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Chris, thank you for sharing. This was so inspiring. Um, hi, John. <laughs> um, so I, I was wondering, how did you start communication within this, the, these communities? I mean, was there English communication or did you have to find, I mean, how, how, did, how does that start? How do you go about that? Um, so that's actually a very good question. And I didn't mention that. So we've, we've designed it with our Permaculture Institute to have both Swahili lessons for local community members. Um, and those are typically free courses for um, different small organizations or small smallhold farmers. And that's done entirely in Swahili because a lot of those people don't know English. Um, but then for the international ones, since we do have international trainers and have people from different countries, because even in East Africa, there's several different languages. Um, so we do those international courses um, in English because that's just the common language. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering if that's something that could go with the ecosystem re restoration camps is teaching English also to the to the local communities. But that's Absolutely. that's a good idea. Yeah. To learn and, the other language. <laughs> yeah, correct. And we, we do some English education for parents within our school. So we do have family literacy programs and do try to improve literacy both in Chris, I can't hear you at this point, but can can you hear me? Yes, yes, now I can hear you, Ken. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Or right. All right, okay. is there another question? You can also raise your hand via the um, um, using the um, option in Zoom. Chris, could you maybe um, tell me more about your um, goals? What would you like to achieve in the upcoming years? Yes, yeah, so in the upcoming years, what we'd like to do as our own organization is um, continue to develop these campus models across uh, Tanzania. So we'd like to have eventually four or five different campuses in different rural communities. Um, and we want each of those places to serve as a hub for transformation kind of on the wider, wider you know, stage. And so we really want to continue what we did last year with these first 10 organizations we partnered with and find, you know, at least five to 10 organizations per year um, around East Africa and continue to kind of have this widespread movement and training through, through them. 
Um, and the other exciting thing that we're very excited about is it doesn't have to be with our ERC connections now, it doesn't have to be just limited to East Africa. Um, we want people from all over the, the world to come and see what we're doing and get involved in um, both the permaculture side of our mission and all the other things that we're doing because we say that permaculture is the thread that kind of holds everything else together and kind of provides for everything else within our organization. So that's, you know, really kind of become the core of, of what we're doing. Thanks. Are there any other questions from people? Yes, Joanne. Hi. Hello. I'm really excited to hear about the uh, main springs in Tanzania and because I've I lived in Kenya for a really long time, so I was always wondering what with permaculture is going on there. And I read um, about Wangari Maathai, who started the Green Belt Movement, and I was wondering if there is any kind of crossover there. Um, we have not been connected to them yet. We're obviously open to any new partnerships and connections, but we haven't, um, yeah, been in touch with them yet. So that would be, that'd be a great connection. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ferdinand, I will ask you to unmute. You're still muted. So, sorry, you're, you're still muted. I will am ask. I, am I, do you hear me now? I didn't press the button, sorry. Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, Chris, uh, did you ever hear about, I met John, by the way, at the project in Uganda, which is called URDT. Did you ever hear of them? Because what is interesting of their model is the way they spread the knowledge over the area. Yes, and John has shared that with us and we are getting in touch with them. So they're, they're, they seem like a fantastic organization, seem like they also do a lot of female empowerment. And um, yeah, so they, they, I think, would have a very, it'd be a very uh, cohesive relationship that we're looking forward to. Yeah. Good. Are there any other questions from people? Oh, I see a question. What, what can we do, Chris, to support your project? Um, well, that's a great question. First of all, um, you know, we constantly need people to help us spread the word. So we post on social media, Facebook and Instagram. If you just like us at Mainsprings, the Janet Bachelor Foundation for Children. Um, and then also we have a variety of videos. So one thing that for the sake of time, we cut out one video because it's a little bit longer, but there's the permaculture ripple effect that further explains kind of our partnerships and what we're doing. Um, along with a, a lot of other varieties. So first thing is helping to just spread the word via social media or on, on YouTube. And if on YouTube, just type in Main Springs, Tanzania, and you'll find us. Um, and then also we're a nonprofit organization, as many of you are. Um, so any, any sort of assistance with partnerships, uh, fundraising, we're always looking for collaborative partnerships in that way. So um, those are kind of the two big ways that people can, can help, as well as we are hoping um, later this year to have some camp opportunities. So um, spreading the word and helping to get people to those camp opportunities will be great. We're just figuring out all of the COVID stuff currently. <laughs> Thanks. I hear that Tuxley has a question. Hello. Hello. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah, this was, this was somewhat related in terms of uh, someone with, with some permaculture skills and interested in, in helping out. I guess, I guess you're working on the camps, but is there, in terms of uh, how would you recommend someone, the best way for them uh, to get, it, get involved, not necessarily with your projects, but, but in, in, in general? And um, where, where would you um, suggest a person start if they want to, to spend time and uh, dedicate uh, themselves to some of this work? Um, I think the ERC platform is probably the best place to start. Um, we all know that. So we, as an organization and camp, have decided that we will accept longer-term volunteers and want people to come, whether it's for a specific, you know, course that we're offering or whether it's kind of for a two or three-month stint. And if they have experience, that is even better. Um, so definitely either through the ERC website um, and that interest form, that's a great place to start. And um, they can also visit our, our website. Mm -hmm. so that has a lot of other information of volunteering and stuff. And we'll be updating it again soon, but it still has a lot of good information. Okay, thank you.
I see a very interesting uh, question from Joe Murray in the chat. Joe, do you want to ask it in, in person or shall I read it? Yes, Joe, I will ask you to unmute first. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I work with a small NGO based in Dublin in Ireland. And uh, I've just been, you know, uh, talking to a sister organization, which is very involved in Central America. And obviously, there's a huge problem there of indigenous people protecting their land and their forests. And they're being threatened, uh, attacked and often killed by corporate interests. Um, and, and it's not just happening in Central America, but Latin America and elsewhere throughout the world. And I'm wondering what this community can do to support people like that who are on the front lines and who are paying the highest price often with their lives. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I think it goes, um, at least for us as an organization, our philosophy is to try to work with those communities and with the government, whether it's on a local scale or even on the national scale, we do both. Um, and it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, especially when you're dealing with developing country governments and things like that. But, you know, if you're really going to have systemic change, we believe, and we've, we've seen this because the government has gotten much more involved with our organization as we've grown. Um, we've seen that, you know, by starting kind of small and just growing organically with the community and just continuing to prove that, you know, what we say is what we're going to do. Um, the government gets more and more involved and then you can have more of a platform. And I think a lot of us within our own communities, again, whether it's local or nationally, um, do have somewhat of a platform where we can, after a bit of time and a bit of uh, reputation, start to speak up for those disenfranchised um, populations. And there's been lots of examples of, you know, in the past few years, Tanzania has kind of had major hits on female rights and contraceptive uh, issues. There's been the Maasai tribe has been, um, they're a nomadic tribe in Tanzania, so they've had a lot of struggles with the government and keeping their own land and being on national reserves. So there's been a lot of struggles there. Um, and there's also just a lot of backwards agricultural policies in Tanzania that we're trying to change. Um, for instance, it's technically illegal to save your own seeds in Tanzania. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, a lot of things that you kind of have to start very small. Like I said, it takes patience. You have to show them what you're doing, why you're doing it, try to get them to buy in what, to what you're doing and then start that secondary conversation of, oh, how can we make that change on a larger scale? So we have it both yes. internally and externally as well. Thank you very much. Yes. So if I could add one word or a few words about that. Um, one of the things that we noticed is that, for instance, here in North America, we've had the indigenous people who've been trying to defend their water sources against industrial actions that are bringing pollution into the river, river areas. And um, one of the things that we saw was that the indigenous people are very vulnerable to police or paramilitary or corporate security people just mm -hmm. killing them. And um, in, in one of these things, it was the natives were mainly the grandmothers were organizing it. So the older women were, were the leaders, but the young men and, you know, had to come and stand in front of the, of the danger, really. And one of the, one of the elders said, because America has all these veterans who have been in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. And so at, at one point, a very large number of these veterans came and they stood between the um, indigenous people and the security forces and the security forces would not shoot them. So this is a very risky thing, but it was so beautiful to see. And, and what the elders said was, we're gonna be okay now that the white people have come to join this movement. 
And um, because it, it changes the dynamic completely. And there is a huge opening for doing this around the world. And it, it, is, it is hard, but uh, I think that's what we need to do is put ecosystem restoration camps everywhere and make sure that they're turning into these beautiful green oasis. And then what, what can happen is that the local people have some support and some some further feeling of security. And the officials are worried about public opinion globally and it gradually, so, so the main thing is peace building and acting from compassion for everybody, not, you know, because I think the, the oppressing people, they're victims too, really. They're, they're not, if they, if they do these horrible things, it's not gonna help their, them either. It's gonna, they're gonna be, have a terrible life because of what they've done. And so that's, uh, you know, that's what I think we have the chance to do. And it's amazing to have a chance to affect these things all over the world. Who would have thought that we could do that? So it's really, for me, that's, that's one of the great reasons to do this. And John, you just sparked something else in me. I'd already mentioned kind of with all of this idea of working with the government and kind of trying to get policies changed. But the other thing that we firmly believe in, and I've seen time and time again, is, you know, so many times people in extreme poverty, especially in East Africa, because that's what I've seen the most of, but um, I think it's true around the world, people in extreme poverty don't have the education, they don't feel empowered, they don't feel like they have a voice um, to speak up for themselves. And one of the reasons I love this mo movement, and what all the different camps are doing is in different ways around the world, we're working with communities and people to educate and empower. And I, you know, it could be about a permaculture design course, but through all of that, you're also giving Chris, you, you're frozen for a bit. Inga? Oh yeah, you're back, I think. Is it me or? Oh, we can't hear him. Okay, unfortunately, he was just telling something really mm. important. Um, Hello? Yes, you're back. I think. Okay, let's hope Chris will join us again soon. Yes, Chris, I see you. But we, the microphone is still, still off. So maybe Well, somebody else should speak because he's somewhat frozen. He is. Oklahoma seems as far away as Tanzania. That's true, John, but we could, we could be starting to talk about uh, legal teams, what you discussed in, in the chat. I mean, we are one hour behind, so people feel free to, to stay and discuss more um, uh, on certain topics. Um, so yes. think, okay. Melissa? Yeah. Hi again. Um, I, yeah, I wanted just to elaborate on my question because I'm thinking if, you know, we're going into p doing these wonderful projects and helping indigenous tribes uh, save their, save their land. I mean, I just don't see how without a very strong legal team, they can even communicate with the government if they're up against big industries because we've, we, we've all seen the disasters that have been happening, I mean, they have, they, have no, they have no voice. So I don't know how just communities of people who are trying to stand up against the government is, even has a chance. So how does that work? I mean, are there, 
Are there legal teams created for these? I mean, does this exist in this kind of situation? Can you all hear me again? Oh, hey, Chris, you're back. <laughs> Hello. Sorry about that. Um, I know in. Oh, your microphone is weird again. <laughs> really unfortunate. John, would you like to react on what Melissa said about the um, legal uh, issues? Well, yeah, there are there are areas, there are groups that only do that, but I I kind of feel like we need a holistic um, thing so that the legal part is part of it, but it's not the whole thing because. You know, if we just talk about these legal aspects and we don't talk about food or or empowerment, um, because people, what we're seeing now in in the camps in different parts of the world is that the people are empowered when they when they have enough food and nutrition and the community is working together to help one another. So when they're when they're in a community and they're acting together as a community, they're stronger than they are as individuals. And happening is the institutions, the corporations are trying to oppress these people. They're trying to divide the people so that they'll be weaker and they can kind of ha have more power over them. So the, the idea that someone wants to have power over someone else is not a very nice idea. You know, so I think this, this can be discussed from from moral and from spiritual perspectives, as well as just from like legal perspectives. And I think that, you know, what we saw, saw in the, in the, with Gandhi and the nonviolent movements is that, you know, if you, if you just try legal aspects or you, or you actually confront the, the, that state that's a state of unconsciousness in a way you know it's it's bigotry it's racism it's it's oppression and you know people who are doing that they, you know if they if their hearts once open they'll, they'll just be miserable because they'll be so ashamed of themselves and it will be so miserable for them to face it and so they don't want to face it but if they do face it then so gradually we need to do that with compassion, with kindness, because if we confront them with, with legalism, like we're gonna arrest you now, well, that's not gonna change their, their mind. <laughs> that's gonna, maybe gonna stop them from doing something bad, but it's, it's gonna leave them in the same state where they would like, I would like to do something bad, but I'm afraid to be punished. So I'm not gonna do something bad because, you know, so that's not the same as, as being good. You know, that's stopping them from being bad. But if, if, if we can get them to the point where they process what this human being and living has equal rights, then it's, it's, it's gonna be better for us and for them too. So can they be redeemed? I mean, I, mean I, I remember going to Rwanda after the, after the uh, genocide there, and I felt really nervous a little bit to go to Uganda. Like, how am I going to feel when I get to, Uganda, to Rwanda and see these people? And half of the people have been perpetrating these atrocities, and the other half are miserable and victims. And it was interesting when I when I went there because I realized that they're all victims and that until they have this truth and reconciliation and they can put the past behind them, they carry this burden, whether they were, whether they were oppressed or whether they were oppressors. And it is in restoration of the landscape and working together to make this happen for everyone 
and of, and they also had the truth and reconciliation um, and situation John, where they actually. I think John, that's that example, and also what Chris was saying that the opposition from the government changed when they saw when the ecosystem restoration type of environmentalism was actually producing really positive results um, that uh, the opposition sort of moved away so that environmentalism became something to be embraced instead of opposed. Correct. And, and that's, I think I, that's what attracts me to ecosystem restoration camps where we're not saying what people can no longer do. We're showing how through restoration and regenerative use of the system, we're showing a path what people can do. And it's actually, I mean, the pictures are evidence uh, that you showed, Chris, a really abundant state of life that we're creating. So it's much better. So that's the positive story, which would you showed in your film, John. It's, it's that thing that attracts and makes environmentalism something to embrace and not something to be afraid of. Um, so thanks, Chris, also for mentioning that. I see, there's a hand, Inge. Yes. And I, Chris, there's there's something in the there's something. In, just a moment. There's something in the chat which you might want to turn off your video, and oh. then your audio will be more more stable. Yes, I think I fixed. We've had an ice storm. I'm currently based in Oklahoma, so I think I fixed it. It knocked out one Wi-Fi, but I got back on another. Can you all hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so hopefully this fixes things, but um, don't know what all <laughs> was left off from my conversation, but I have seen a few of the uh, questions in the chat, if we have a couple minutes for me to answer those. Um, there was definitely one from Lisa um, in New Mexico that was wondering about the original boys' school. Um, and that one is still in existence. We um, have supported them with a, a variety of different food services and things like that. Um, and also all of our programs except for the home, the residential program, are co-ed. So we do have about half boys, half girls. Um, we had a lot of debate in the beginning as an organization of if we wanted to be co-ed or if we wanted just to be four females. But in the Tanzanian society, especially where we are, um, we felt that it, it wouldn't be advantageous for us just to empower the, the girls and not also you know, teach and empower the boys to also kind of respect their rights and respect the relationship that they should have. Um, so all of our programs are co-ed and we work, you know, with both boys and girls, men and women to find that equity and, and empower both both sides of the, the piece. Um, we just have kept the residential program all girls because we know teenagers, we know what happens. <laughs> um, so for the safety of the girls, didn't want to mix the, the boys and girls, especially with teenagers, but everything else is co-ed. Um, and you. also I, oh, yes. Sorry, continue. Oh, I was going to answer the second one about people from Africa on the call. Um, so we do have an ERC Africa group and a lot of those are locally led. Um, we as an organization, one thing I didn't mention is I lived in Tanzania full time for about 10 years and about six years ago moved back to the US to be headquartered here, really work on fundraising for growth and development. But the main reason for that move and transitioning out of international staff is from the very beginning, we wanted to be an organization run by Tanzanians for Tanzanians. Um, so for the past year and a bit, we have 100% East African staff in Tanzania, um, our country director, second in command, all of our managers, directors, teachers. Um, they're all mostly Tanzanian, a few Kenyans as well, but um, all East African um, running their organization. They, they are truly the ones that own all of the programs that we do. And we are just here for support and connections. And I like to say my job now is just to be a connector <laughs> and just try to keep both accountability up up and above board but also just make the connections and make things happen for our team in Tanzania to do the actual work and believe that's very important. Yes. Um, I know that Mac raised her hand as well. Um, Mac Walker? Oh yeah. Hi, yeah I think you just addressed my question Chris because it really was about um, about building trust as as a white as a white person from a colonizing nation, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get past uh, the, the suspicion, especially in the beginning before you have, you know, uh, successful results to show for your efforts? But I think you were, you know, you were saying that uh, just now that you're trying to make it a total East African effort, 
And, but in the beginning, it wasn't. And I'm wondering, how did you build trust? Was it through um, p local partnerships, finding you know, local, uh, local stakeholders who were really involved with you? Were there any, you know, I mean, we have this problem in this country too, when you want to, uh, you know, working with communities of color who have every reason to dis distrust us, you know, to, to build that kind of trust is, uh, and, and to build, be able then to build capacity within the community is not always easy. Correct. Um, especially in the beginning, like I said, I was 19 and young and dumb when I started, but from the very beginning, um, you know, A, communicating in Swahili and the local languages is very important, making sure that you respect the cultures, make sure you learn kind of the intricacies of the day in and day outs of the culture, how you greet people, how you can communicate well. Um, so that was definitely key from the very beginning is becoming fluent in languages, becoming um, well-versed with the different aspects of the Tanzanian culture and especially the tribal region that we were in. And then also the other really, really big piece of all of that is, um, you know, it can't be a top-down leadership style. It can't be just, you do this, you do this, you do this. Obviously, you know, we do have employees, they have contracts, there's things like that. But from one of the things that works the most in gaining trust is giving people ownership over things. And if they have a piece of ownership, if they have some skin in the project, if they know, you know, my kids are going to go to this school as well, I want it to be the best school possible. Or, hey, my family's also, you know, participating in this permaculture program, and I want to learn everything I can here so that I can help, you know, provide for my family better. Um, you know, having people with that level of ownership and that skin in the game is really key um, to having a, a robust organization, because now we have over um, 100 employees across both campuses and everything. So it's, again, all East African and Tanzania, and um, they truly do own their different departments and their jobs. Thank you. Um, Chris, I, I do have a, a, a question myself. Um, congratulations that you're such a high quality school. I'm very um, interesting. How, how did you, or how did, did mainsprings be able to to have such a high quality of education how did you do that yeah so we have a variety of partnerships with schools around the world that help with our teacher development um, from the very beginning we were all of our teaching staff was east african but a lot of them were trained in very traditional rote memorization type techniques um, so what we have done is just collaboratively with them year over year month over month have staff development sometimes we have um, professors and different people either from Tanzania or from the US or you know Malawi one time come in and do just different teaching met methodology workshops um, really dive into our classrooms but we're always working with our teachers to address both the cultural needs um, as well as try to have a little bit more of a holistic educational outlook so it's taken a lot of time because you're talking about slowly changing a mindset and kind of the teaching methodologies without compromising um, the cores of the culture. And so that's why we wanted to do it very slowly and over time. Wow, great achievements. John. Yeah, I, I want to change course just a little bit and ask a favor of everybody. I've started to do it personally, like when I meet people, I ask them to become a member of the ecosystem restoration camps movement be, because what I, what I see is that our level of camp development is growing really rapidly. So there are 37 camps now and that, that's in like four years. So that's really pretty rapid and we can see that many more camps are lining up to join. And what we really need is more supporting members to make this thing work because there are going to be hundreds or thousands of camps pretty soon and in some places where the economies are really in trouble like let's say Somalia or some of these places like this where we can we can really make a difference by by supporting camps but in order to do that we either have to depend on very large donations from the existing foundations and charities or from the United Nations or from governments or something like this. But I think 
one of the problems and one of the reasons that I was so interested in helping to create this movement was because I didn't really feel like the institutional responses were fast enough or effective enough or and, and especially they weren't very cost effective because the the high overheads for those institutions mean that most of the money which is is um, coming into those organizations goes to maintain the organization and only pennies on the dollar go out to the field to work in the field so if if we as people don't and don't have a huge overhead then the majority of what we do can go to these camps and that depends on our ability to make a people-based organization a mass organization and so far we're still we're still a little bit behind in that in that area so we need to have vastly more people and i think if you just go and say look and it's not so much about money how much money is offered by the individuals it's more about that they actually make a tiny donation and we have millions of them so so if everybody could start 907 starting to peter today who are who are members and that's even less than we had that then in the very beginning we we ask people are there would anybody share 10 euros and when a thousand people offered to share 10 euros we said okay well we'll have to start but then we still don't even have a thousand after all this time but we do have bigger donors but that is not as effective i think in becoming a mass organization you know we can just be a normal organization that takes big money from big money but uh it's it's nice if 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 the membership continues to grow so that's that's my my pitch just tell your friends and family please join the ecosystem restoration camps movement it's it's going really well there are lots of camps so thank you john it's a, a very important to spread the world word. I saw people responding on your what you were saying. Um, so yeah, that would be wonderful. I know most of you are all, already members, so we are really, really thankful for that. And therefore, we really enjoy uh, seeing you here. Are there any other topics that people would like to discuss or like to know more about? We are all here still in one call, so we could still discuss very interesting topics. Yes, Kath? Um, hi, everyone. Someone in the chat had a question for Chris, and I don't think we've covered it yet. And it was around how does land ownership work in Tanzania? So as a non-Tanzanian, um, do you have it? I, I'm curious to know, is it on sort of a, um, do you have a concession from the government? Is it on long lease? Do you own the land? Because that's, that could be a very big barrier to entry for other people wanting to do similar projects in countries that they don't live in. Obviously, there's local legislation and it differs from country to country, but it would be quite interesting to hear your perspective on how you handle that part of, of your project development. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so when we first started, again, because we wanted to build trust within the community and with the government, and it, a lot of things were very tricky to even figure out how you get registered. We actually went under an, another umbrella organization, which was that Center for Street Boys. Um, so we were under them for the first few, few years in Tanzania under their board of directors, um, while we slowly worked with the government to build trust and then eventually got our own registration. So we are registered as a Tanzanian NGO um, with a partnership with our US nonprofit organization. So in Tanzania, um, we have a local board that is all Tanzanians, again, all local staff, um, and they are registered as a Tanzanian entity. And we always felt that was going to be very important. Um, so both any registered Tanzanian entity or company or individual can buy land, but when I say buy land in quotes, it's actually a 99 year lease from the government. 
So that's how all land ownership works in Tanzania, is it is a 99 year lease. So we, we do get it deeded and we get a 99 year lease from is the that, government. Is that renewable? Is that what? Is it renewable? Is it yes. renewable? Because yeah. after 99 years, you've made a lot of investment in the land. Yes, it is I renewable. Think okay. It's renewable for a few dollars. Like you just have to kind of reapply for the deed. Yeah, so does that answer your question, Catherine? It does, thank you. And I'm just also quite curious to know, um, in terms of your ongoing relationship with the local government, um, mm -hmm. have you received their approval for what you're doing with the land that they've made available to you? And I'm not, I mean, obviously they must be delighted with um, the, 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 the um, the progress you've made in terms of, of uplifting education and bringing that number down to 16 learners to one teacher, but um, specifically inquiring in terms of the permaculture development of the land. Yes, I would say we've had much more success on kind of the district level. So that's kind of like a county or kind of a subsect of a state. So in our kind of area of a few hundred thousand people um, in our district, um, that government has definitely been much more involved. They've sent different members of their agriculture team within the government to various trainings and tours of our farm um, have gotten involved in that way. Um, I would say we haven't been as successful going to the national level yet. Again, there's just a lot of kind of international aid push that works against restoration in Tanzania, um, whether it's working with Monsanto. And again, you're not supposed to harvest your own seeds or sell your own seeds because they want all GMO seeds that are imported into the country. Um, and that's just, you know, a profit for the government and that's why they do it. So there's a lot of national policies um, that we would love to change in the future, um, but we're kind of working in our own, own area first. And we've even been working um, with team members at the ERC and with our, our team in Tanzania to take on some government land in our district and help to reforest it because the tribe in the area has, over the past several generations, basically decimated, cut down all the trees for firewood and charcoal um, without replanting. So there's a lot of kind of the beginning of desertification in our area and we want to bring it back to that natural environment and the government is definitely willing to work with us to regreen that and, and create a sustainable harvesting plan with the local communities as well. So in our area of northern Tanzania, yes. On the national level, no. <laughs> Not yet. Joe. Oh. All right. May, may I ask a question on top of that question, that, that topic you were just talking about? So um, specifically about Monsanto, how do you think you're going to confront that eventually to, I mean, because that, that's actually where I was going with the whole legal battle, because, you know, when you're working with governments and the big industries, they, you know, they don't want to let go of that money. So even if you have a, the holistic approach, which I believe in, which John, you were so, um, you're so right about, I, I think it would be much more of a peaceful way to do it and it should be done that way. But when you're going up against that kind of money, how, what, is, what are your steps? I mean, what do you envision <laughs> to get to that, to that level? Um, I think the, this movement needs to be kind of, I totally agree with John, at the core of the movement, yeah. this international, um, you know, widespread people-centered movement that really creates just an international knowledge about what is happening and what needs to happen to heal our earth. And healing our earth also helps heal the communities that our earth, you know, supports. Um, but at the same time, I think it is also important to get the bigger donors and, and different big players in the international scene. Um, you know, for instance, if we could collectively convince Bill Gates <laughs> that this is the answer, um, there's your answer to Monsanto. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So obviously that's a really, really big high level thing, but John might be able to convince him one day. Um, <laughs> I think it kind of is. I would nuance that just a little bit. It's very important that Bill Gates changes his mind because he's promoting GMOs and chemical industrial agriculture throughout Africa the developing world. But the the thing that I think is critically important is that we have distributed resources. So for instance, knowledge or the knowledge of how to harvest water, how to maintain and stimulate the lower hydrological cycle about seeds, 
So you, you, you really badly need to have seed saving and seed trading. And this shouldn't be individuals because their liability, if, if you have the situation that you have in Tanzania where it's technically illegal to save your own seeds, then you need to have this risk distributed. So having lots of ecosystem restoration camps with, with seeds everywhere, everybody has seeds, seeds are shared, seeds are traded, seeds are saved, and there's training in this. That's how you defeat Monsanto, not giving more power to Bill Gates, but giving power to the people to protect and maintain the, the genome, the legacy genome. It certainly doesn't belong to anybody. Anybody is going to die. Human beings haven't been here for 3.6 billion years since evolution has been creating this amazing resource. So it doesn't belong to anybody and it should be shared in this way. That's, that's I think, the best, the best idea. Thank you. Um, Joe, you still had a question? I think my question has been answered exactly on that point. I, like I'm horrified to hear that it's illegal to own your own seeds in Tanzania. And I know that that's not just Tanzania, it's all over. And my question was, how, how, do, how do you operate in that situation? Does Chris manage to work around that and use indigenous open pollinated seeds? And you know, can that happen? It, it can happen. Um, it's, I will say it is underground. It's a law in Tanzania, so it wouldn't be able like, to go on a massive scale of us selling different seeds and things like that. Um, but we do it on a very local scale and, and many farmers still do. I don't think it's something that would be truly regulated on a local small scale level, um, just because it's probably not that important to the national government. Um, however, if it did become a business or it did become kind of a bigger movement of much larger exchanges that was actually affecting the economy behind the seeds, um, that's probably where the government would step in. So we, we are able ourselves to harvest our own seeds and, and work with indigenous uh, plant species as well. Um, but just are not really able to do it on a large scale. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Are there any other questions on, on this topic? Oh, so there's a question from Darren that says, can you speak more specifically about the success of permaculture food production and supplying food for the local project, um, as well as the community possibly, and that is winning, or that possible winning heart. So, um, Yes, we do have a ton of food. We have, what's our kilos per year? Yeah, so from our first campus farm, we get about 50,000 kilos of fresh produce every year um, on top of livestock and on top of different fruits and, and different perennial crops. Um, so we provide over a thousand meals a day at our school. So we have breakfast and lunch for all of our students and staff. I think Chris is frozen again. No. Oh, no, <laughs> okay. I was like, I can see you. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. So yeah, we have over from that one campus, like I said, over 50,000 kilos and that helps feed, you know, our own community. So over a thousand meals a day, but we also do um, a variety of community service projects where we reach out to different families and provide struggling families with food at different times. Um, and we also have a lot of excess that we can sell. We're working currently on trying to do more value added products so that we can sell in um, city markets and places and ultimately just become more sustainable as an organization as well. So the first goal was definitely feeding our own campus and, you know, the hundreds of mouths that we have on our campus. Um, but from there, since we have so much excess, you know, we're helping support beyond, beyond our campus borders and also trying to help it help us become more sustainable in Tanzania. Because again, that helps to lessen that dependence on the Western country, which is ultimately what we want. Yeah. And how, uh, there's a question from Alice, how do your neighbors view what you are doing compared to their farm? Um, so it's, I would say it's hit and miss, and I'm sure we've all experienced some people who can see something and really buy in. Like we have so many of our neighbors who, you know, just walk because we don't have gates or fences on our campus. So people just walk through all the time. There's a public road through our campus. Um, and we love that because that allows people just to come and see the difference. And we literally have traditional maize fields right next to our permaculture plot sometimes. And that's a great example um, to show what transformation can happen in a relatively short amount of time. Um, but then there's, 
obviously some who are, are still very stuck in their ways. And there's a lot of education from the government and different kind of campaigns of use this fertilizer, use this seed. This is how you're going to, you know, make change. So there's just a lot of conflicting information for some people. So I'd say we have a lot of great, great buy-in from the community. A lot of people that have taken the different practices and implemented it on their own land, um, but still working on others. And I think that's, that's probably always going to be the case because humans have different perspectives and different backgrounds. Yeah, that's true. I'm also very curious, Chris, about, um, about the girls that you're empowering. Um, what, at what age do they leave the campus? And, and oh. how, do, how do they generally, what, what does their life look like after? Yes, so that's a great question. So we take girls as young as three, but they can come in at any age. And we basically, since many of them get a kind of late start in life and maybe haven't had a good educational foundation, um, we do some educational testing, see where the best placement is for them in our school. And we are devoted to living with them on campus through the end of their secondary school or high school here in the Western world. So we do that on our campus. And then for all of our residential girls, we actually support them in their higher education as well. Um, so we have several generous donors who help to pay for college or university fees. Some of them want to go into trade schools. Um, there's some agricultural stuff. So there's a variety of options, but we want to support them all in getting their tertiary, tertiary education. Whether that's like an associate's degree or a bachelor's, we have some that are working towards their master's. Wow. Um, yeah, so we, we support them all the way through that. Wow. And do, do you use the philosophy of permaculture in, in your education system as well? We do. So we have that as a part of our extracurricular kind of lessons. So we have a permaculture lessons for all grades, third grade and up, um, either once or twice a week, depending on the week. But yeah, so we have our permaculture trainer that really focuses on educating our students. And that's, we believe, again, we want that holistic, well-rounded um, student to graduate from our school. And so that's, we believe that's helping them be prepared for a globalized world and helping them understand technology. But that's also helping them to really connect with the history of their culture and the different aspects of their culture, as well as, you know, connecting with the land because so much of Tanzania still relies on farming. And it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't have those 450 students get actively involved day in and day out in our permaculture programs. Wonderful. John, you raised your hand. I, I just wanted to add something. Um, for, for the Ernest there, is has been at the Ugandan Rural Development Training Centers, and they have the African Rural University, which is an all women's university. And so, Chris, could you send your email to Ferdy Nest, Ferdy Ernest, yes. there, and um, in the chat and. Maybe you guys could connect and, and uh, it would be wonderful if your girls could go to that university because when, when those, those girls from that university come out, they, be, they become the, the sort of leaders in community development in the, in the communities that they come from. And so they're being trained to go back to the communities where they were abused and abandoned and become like the educated leaders of, that, of those communities. And it's really powerful because they go back without any fear and with huge courage and commitment. It's amazing. So I really, I really hope that that connection will take place. Yes, and I, I just sent my email along in a direct message. And I'll go ahead and put it to everyone so you all have it as well. If anybody else has connections or everything. That's a great connection, John. Yes. Thank you. Um, Darren is asking, uh, Chris, do you have any interaction with local wildlife and nature conservation efforts integrated as part of a holistic ecosystem generation? Um, so we currently do not. Um, we're very close to the Serengeti and we also have a relationship with the Grumetti Reserve Fund and they have a hotel and do a lot of reservations, um, preservation and restoration on their land. Um, so we do have 
several times where our students can go visit kind of the natural ecosystems and see what is happening there, um, but we don't do it on our, our campus currently. Um, one of the next things we want to do on a larger scale is, like I mentioned, work with the government on government land to kind of reforest some decimated areas. Um, but eventually, I think that's something that we could definitely look into. Um, yeah. Okay. And I also, Ellen, Ellen asked a question, how has this impacted your personal life over these 15 years? <laughs> um, so life has been crazy. Like I said, I lived in Tanzania for 10 years and loved it. And while I was there, I actually adopted four boys myself. Um, so that was a massive change in my personal life. So I now have four boys. Um, and they obviously moved back when I did to the US. And so they're here now. Um, but also even through learning and living the permaculture life, when I moved back to the U US, I was in the city and had a house and just really wasn't fulfilled, missed the life in Tanzania. And just during this pandemic um, last summer actually sold my house and moved to a farm here in Oklahoma and have started uh, working on restoration and design of that in a permaculture method. So um, yeah, it's through basically our entire mission is, is my life as well. So whether it's a personal side or the organizational side, um, I want to live what we, what we preach. So it's impacted me in a great way. That's all fantastic things that have happened in my life because of this work. Amazing such a inspi inspirational story for, for all of us yeah Thank you. and that's such a young age 19 that's really i don't know it's a beautiful story we should Thank tell you. everyone from the erc Thank movement you. about it Thank you. um are there any more questions or topics that people would like to discuss I see all wonderful compliments in the chat. Yes, and thank you to everyone for the wonderful compliments. It means a lot. Yes. Okay, I think we are going to uh, to end uh, end it a bit. Thank you all very very much for well your contribution, and thank you Chris and John for your time and your explanation and your words, and the inspiration of course. Um, I really enjoyed it. Sorry for the technical issues in, at the beginning. We'll uh, improve that for next time, but we're really thankful for all of you and um, hope to see you soon again um, for the next fireside chat will be next month, the second Tuesday of the week.